yourself. Hi everyone. Hey. Hello. Hopefully you had a nice lunch. You ready for class or do we need another minute? Yeah. Woo. -hoo. All right. Um, so I'm Sasha Erno. I am a technical support specialist here, uh, which means I spend all day, every day, answering customer phone calls from people like you. Uh, I've been doing this for about six years now. Uh, I'm Graham Parker, and as you may be able to tell by the accent, I'm not actually from around here. Um, I'm from the ETC Limited Office in London. Um, my current title is Events and Training Specialist. I've only been doing this job for a couple of months now. Prior to that, I was a field service engineer. Uh, for about seven or eight years out of London, so slightly different to some of the field service engineers around here. I did technical support as well, like Sasha on the phones um, and various other things as well. Pretty wide ranging job. So I know most of the ETC products to a certain extent. Uh, this class is also for ETCP credit, so if you're one of the people who is signing up for that, make sure you come up at the end and sign another piece of paper. I think we should sign in case. That's I'm not sure what ETCP's policy on that would be. Yes, because <laughs> I know you were here. We'll we'll make that work. <laughs> okay, um, so we're gonna kind of go through um, our, our outline for this class here. So we're gonna talk about data types and different types of data, how they get from point A to point B. A little bit of networking overview, even though we know that's a data type, we wanna make sure you have a good understanding of how network <coughs> topology works. And then we're gonna talk about some tools you could use to troubleshoot issues in your system before finally traveling into some troubleshooting scenarios. Do you feel free to stick your hand up at any point if you've got questions about anything, but we can do questions at the end as well. So stop as if we're confusing you, but we're gonna go pretty quickly through some of these just to refresh your minds, really. A lot of them are covered in some of the other courses as well, so. Got a little bit of overlap everywhere. <laughs> All right, so um, these are our main data types that we use for communication in lighting systems, especially those designed by ETC. So DMX, ETC Net 2, ETC Net 3, and also Streaming ACN, and ArtNet. So a little bit more verbosely. I think most people are at least vaguely familiar with DMX. Right? So you have one channel per parameter, and in the case of like your dimmers, that'd be one channel per one dimmer. Uh, so we're just sending level data on that one channel from zero to 255, which is a range of out to full. Uh, so this is a constant stream at 44 hertz, and you get 512 unique addresses, and we call that segment of unique addresses a single universe. So every 512 addresses you start back over at one, have a new universe, and each DMX line can only carry one universe worth of data. Uh, so uh, the other thing about DMX is that we have something called RDM, which is remote device management, that travels on the same line. So these RDM packets actually interweave with the DMX information with the DMX level packets and travel back and forth, whereas DMX just goes one direction. But we are using the same wires for that communication. Okay, so Net2 is a, a network protocol, travels down your ethernet network. Anybody still use Net2 that they know of in their building? Yeah? So we're still outputting Net2 from the consoles. Um, it's actually a legacy protocol effectively now, but we still output because some of you guys still have equipment which receives it. Um, so it's normally coming transmitted out of your console um, or your architectural controller. It's basically mostly DMX over Ethernet is what we're talking about with Net2. Um, it did, EDMX was, was the name of the protocol within Net2, so you'll find out in a minute SACN is the one in Net3, but that's the DMX levels that are going down there. So this now allows us to send multiple universes down one cable. So actually 32,000 addresses um, under EDMX down one cable. Um, and then it can break out when you get to nodes or go straight into your dimmer racks, that kind of thing. Um, it also allowed you remote uh, video and remote controls. So uh, there was an ETC net originally, which didn't allow for most of these things really. It was pretty basic, um, but here you got added in remote video. So if you, some of you will have RVIs or RFUs, and um, that's also running over net too. So lots of protocols down one wire. Uh, just an interesting point with that, we're going to talk about a couple of troubleshooting shoot tools as we go along. Um, for Net2, there's something called Net2 Utils. It's a little bit like a DMX tester for Net2. So it's a really handy bit of software to run. There's pretty much one for every protocol we're going to talk about. But it shows you what you're receiving, um, and it can also send out 
data as well. Then we came to Net3. Net3 is actually a suite of protocols put together. So it is both streaming ACN, which is a protocol that has been standardized across our industry, and some proprietary things that we've added in for communication with our devices. And we travel these over the same <coughs> Ethernet infrastructure that Net2 would have traveled over. So you have a network switch that is your main hub for communication, and network cables that are all your spokes going out to different devices like Net3 gateways, which can then translate that out to DMX for your fixtures. Um, SACN is not a proprietary protocol. Like I said, it's standardized. But when we say Net3, we really want to emphasize that it is our stuff. And that's what allows us to do things like RDM over Net3. There is no standard for RDM over network. But we've added it into our Net3 suite so that you can do RDM communication with fixtures through Net3 gateways. Um, so we do that through ACN, which is a little bit different than streaming ACN. We're not going to bog you down with too, too many details on that. Um, but SACN will allow you to carry multiple universes of data over the sing same single network line. You end up at a gateway. The gateway says, I'm only listening for this universe, and it spits it out on the DMX line for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there's another protocol um, called ArtNet. So uh, the analogy I would normally use for this uh, is that it's like uh, it's like the Hoover analogy, which Sasha tells me means nothing to you guys. <laughs> so uh, in the UK, if we refer to a vacuum cleaner, we'll call it a Hoover. It's actually a manufacturer, right? So pass me a Kleenex, right? <laughs> um, you're asking for a tissue. Um, Artnet is actually a proprietary protocol by artistic license. Artnet is not the global term for DMX over Ethernet. It's actually someone's protocol. It's artistic license. Um, it's just like SACN. It's just like EDMX. It's transporting multiple universes of DMX over the network, basically. Um, it's, it's an OK protocol. You'll find it everywhere. A lot of media servers use it. A lot of consoles will output it. A lot of consoles are outputting ArtNet before they're outputting streaming ACN. There's a few limitations with ArtNet. Um, it's a bit limited in the number of universes. It's very bandwidth heavy. So that means it takes up a lot of the space on the network, effectively. Um, originally, ArtNet 1, I think, allowed you a maximum of 40 universes. ArtNet 2 then allowed you 256. ArtNet 3, theoretically, 32,000 universes. Um, but it's very bandwidth heavy. It's broadcasting everywhere on the network. We'll talk a little bit about multicast, not very much in a while. Streaming ACN is multicast. It only sends the data to the people who want it, whereas ArtNet is broadcasting to everybody. So it's sending it across the whole network. Every line out of your network switch is getting all the data. Um, so it's bogging down devices because they're receiving things they don't need. So it's good. It's, it's an OK protocol, but it's, uh, it's got a few limitations. Um, as I said about the, the misconception, ArtNet is not the only DMX over Ethernet protocol. Um, again, there's a handy troubleshooting tool. Uh, artists that license have something called DMX Workshop. There's also something called ArtNet Omic. Art net Art nominator. Art nominator. You try and pronounce it. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's uh, also like just like a DMX tester for Artnet. So there's those tools you can get. Bits of software you can download for free for all these protocols. Okay, so um, with SACN, we're kind of going to focus on that because this is the current protocol that we're using in most of our newly installed systems. If you're going to be using network from most of our EOS family or Cobalt family consoles, chances are you're doing SACN or Net2. Um, but mostly SACN. So um, it allows you to have multiple sources on the same network. And when this happens, you need to figure out who's going to take priority, who's going to speak. So earlier in the day, you guys were talking about having an architectural system and your console on the same system and who gets to control lighting when. On SACN lines, each packet, in addition to the level data, also contains priority data. And this tells the receiving device what it's going to listen to. So. When I have my geo console send out information on SACN and I set it to a priority of 100, which is the <coughs> default, and it reaches the receiving device, if the receiving device is getting two sets of data, whichever one has the higher number of priority, it's what it's going to respond to. It's going to ignore the other. Okay? If the data comes in at the same priority, then we HTTP out, which is what we would do with DMX. The highest level is going to win out. So I like to personify this a little bit. I always say if you're thinking about your network and you have your paradigm system and you have your EOS console both speaking, one of them is sending data that says, no, I'm louder, but it's the receiving device that is deciding whether or not it's listening 
right? And if you're getting louder data, you're going to listen to it. Um, so essentially, if you've got more than one source online and you can't figure out why things are stuck, perhaps check what the priority setting on your system is, and you can find out if maybe your other system is in control right now. So maybe Paradigm has your lights on, can't take over from your geo, up the priority on your geo, and all of a sudden you get control of all your lighting. Great. We're going to take a quick look at networking here. Um, there are networking classes, which you may be going to. I don't want to get bogged down in this, but just so you understand a bit of the background. I know some people are a little bit scared by networking, and they don't know what all those numbers mean. Um, who knows what an IP address is? Okay, so like half the room. Who knows what a subnet mask is? Again, half the room. Um, so there's a few things here. Um, when you create a network, all of your devices need to be able to communicate with each other. So they need to have some sort of identifier. So that's the IP address. There's a couple of other things. There's things like MAC address as well, which is actually a more unique identifier. But within your network, every device should have an IP address. So when you're sending those packets of data out from one device to another, it can decide who it's sending it to. So that goes to its IP address. So you can think about this a little bit like a street address in a town or like a phone number. That's how it's directing the traffic. Um, a uh, yeah, little note there, no two devices should have the same IP address because that's going to get confusing, right? If you send something out to one address, two devices receive it. Uh, a subnet is a way to divide up a network effectively. So you're going to have a bunch of devices with IP addresses on that network, um, and they all have a subnet mask <coughs> within those devices. And that masks who can see who. So you, de you define which devices talk to each other. So you can have lots of devices connected to the same network switch, um, and they're all going to talk to each other, have the potential to talk to each other. But sometimes you want to limit that. So you may have lighting and sound on the same network. Different subnet masks will mean that some of those devices can talk to each other, and some can't. Generally, you're going to keep your subnet mask the same. We do have standard <coughs> ETC IP addressing and subnet mask schemes. Normally, they'll be the same in a fairly simple network. Uh, there's another set of numbers here. So you'll see if you've looked at an EOS console or any network device, in the network settings, you've got IP address, subnet mask. And it's either called a gateway IP or a router. Router. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, it's not a Net3 gateway, so you may know what a Net3 gateway is. It's one of these little boxes here. <coughs> that takes Ethernet data in and spits out DMX or vice versa. This is not what we're talking about here. Um, this is another set of numbers which looks like an IP address. It may be another device on the network, which may be this, which is probably something you've seen in your house. A lot of people will have one of these in their house. That's a router. router. Um, <laughs> it allows two networks to talk to each other. So in your house, you have the internet coming in. That's a network. Um, but within your house, you have your own private network. So you have the wider area network, which is the internet, and your local area network. And that device is routing traffic between the two. Um, we don't really use them in lighting networks unless it's a particularly big network. There are some venues which use them um, because, again, they've got like lighting, sound, video, everybody sharing a network, they're routing traffic. Some venues I know, even we never say do this, but <coughs> even connect their network infrastructure to the internet. Um, which we wouldn't really recommend unless you really know what you're doing with your system. But um, I've seen it, and I've seen it work very well, but you need routers, routers involved there. Um, so it, you're probably not going to see it, but um, the, the number that you put in this box, effectively, is the IP address of that router. Um, you don't want to leave that box blank, really. Even if you don't have one, you just want to put in 10.101.1.1 in an ETC world. It just needs a little something in there um, to try and talk to. So our standard IP addresses would start with 10.101. There's no reason why you have to follow this system. It makes it much easier if you phone us up and we know that you're running a standard EPC, ETC IP address scheme. Um, a geo console out of the box will come with 10.101, 91.101 as its IP address. And ION is 10.101, 100.101. So we try and make that easier for you. So if you get those two consoles, plug them together via your network switch, they'll talk to each other already. They don't have clashing IP addresses. They're all set the same. The only time you have to change, obviously, if you have two geos, then one of them's got to change. 
So it'll be 10101 something something, 255, 255, 00. Theoretically, they would all talk to each other with this setup. So when you're troubleshooting, if your network devices aren't talking to each other, this is one of the first places to look. First, first place I would look is the little blinking light on the back of it. Um, and then if that's not blinking, I'd start looking at my cables or my network switch. But if you're pretty good there, I'd start looking at your IP addresses and maybe someone's changed something. And our standard gateway IP address is 10.101.11. You've all got this handout, so you've all got that little link in there. That's our standard IP addressing table, so it shows you all of our products and what their standard IP addresses should be. So, up here are some IP addresses and subnet masks for different devices. So this is one device, here's another device. They're in green, they're good, they're talking to each other. So we know that because the subnet mask is the same. So where you see the four octets there, 255, 255, 0, 0, that's its subnet mask. Both the same. They both have IP addresses which start with 10101. So those octets above and below each other then, 10 and 255, they talk to each other effectively. So 255 is like, think of it like full or blocked. Um, so if you've got 255 there, the only thing that you can put in an IP address, octet, first octet, is 10 on both devices. Not, it's not 10, it's got to be the same. Yeah. So if you have a 255 in your subnet mask, then your first octet or your second octet, whichever matches that 255, needs to have the same number on both devices, otherwise they won't talk to each other. You get further down the subnet, and you've actually got 0, 0, which is 0. So that's open. So in this first example, 10101, 10101, it's all good. 255, 255 is all good. Then you've got 90 and 95. They can talk to each other because the subnet mask, the octet, third octet, um, is actually a zero, which means that any number in the IP address can talk to any other number. And again, the 101 doesn't really matter. They're not matching IP addresses because they've got 90 and 95. So that's a good standard ETC IP address that would be an RPU and an EOS console out of the box. Um, you can change your subnet mask depending on how many IP addresses you need to have available. Actually a 255.255.0.0 subnet um, gives you a lot of IP addresses. You could make it 255.255.255.0, which actually means that you've basically got yourself 255 IP addresses there because you're using that last octet, 254 theoretically. You're using your last octet um, as the, the number of IP addresses that you can assign. So you would have to have 10, 90, 10, 101, 90, and 255, 255, 255, and then you've got 254 numbers which you can use in that last octet available to you. The bottom one is actually a wider subnet. I've taken one of the 255s out of there. So we can use any number in the third octet for the IP address between 1 and 254. Same with the next one along and the same with the next one along. So actually if you do the maths on that, you end up with an awful lot of IP addresses. Mm -hmm. So this is how you would close down your network a little bit. So you could, looking at the top again, uh, 255, 255, 000 is your subnet mask. You could have some other devices on this network with an IP of say 5.5. something something. They'd all talk to each other, but none of them would be able to talk to the 10101 devices because they're not in the same subnet. So if you look at the bad subnet masks, see if any of this has actually made sense. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with that first one? Why those two devices on that first line won't talk to each other? The third octet has to be the Yes, yep. of the IP address in this case. <coughs> yeah, if you want to make it work, you need a 10.101.90 on both or 10.101.95 on both. That third octet just has to match because your third octet of your subnet mask is 255. It's not allowing any communication between any devices that don't match. The bottom one should be fairly obvious. <laughs> That's a completely different IP address. So again, the subnet mask is defining there that the first two octets need to be the same. So nothing's going to talk to each other on that uh, in those two devices, in theory. Did that make sense? Yeah, does Everyone? it make sense? Please do ask if it doesn't. Would that be the same way of like putting like an RF pool off your iPad? Yeah, and we're going to talk about that, yeah. 
Um, We're going to spend some time on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but you do need to set up IP addresses there. Uh, your iPad needs to have an IP address. You either need to put that IP address into it or it needs to receive it from somewhere, which again we'll talk about. Yep. Uh, just while you're between topics, I want to let you know some people back here are having a hard time hearing. So if you could speak okay. Okay, sure. Thanks. And Sorry I've got a really that. bad Absolutely. accent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I'll talk up a bit. Um, and if you need translations, just just ask Kasha. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, a couple of little tips here. Um, so streaming ACN, that's the DMX over Ethernet part of Net3. It's what's called a multicast protocol. So I said ArtNet is a broadcast protocol, which is going to any device on the network. Um, SACN is multicast. The ins and outs of that, again, are a bit more complicated, but it's basically going to send to a multicast IP address, which your network switch um, will then manage and it will send that out to anybody who's requesting that information. Um, so it's not flooding the network, it's not flooding every device. The other nice thing about it going to that multicast IP address is that anybody can ask for it and it doesn't matter what their subnet is. They can be in a different subnet and we'll show you this in a while. Um, streaming ACN will just go pretty much everywhere on the network. So it's really nice because it means you don't have to set up your network devices necessarily. Your console could be in a different IP range to your gateway. You'll still get DMX out of your gateway. Uh, however, two consoles in different subnets won't be able to synchronize with each other. They're using other protocols which aren't necessarily multicast, and they need to be in the same range as each other. <coughs> so you could have a half working system here, and this is important when you're troubleshooting, because you might call us up and go, well, I'm getting DMX out, but my backup console won't synchronize. Um, or I can't configure my gateway by a Net3 concept from the console. Again, that's because it's not in the same IP range. So there's only one thing actually working in your system, but that's because of the, the kind of beauty of SACN and multicast. Um, and again, yeah, it says here, CM3s won't be able to be configured. So it really is just that DMX over Ethernet SACN thing that, that may work. Okay, so you guys got a bit of this from David. We're going to repeat it because it really, really needs repeating. Don't get dead. Never, ever, ever, ever work in a live rack. If you're taking out dimmers or anything like that, you're exposing yourself to very high voltage and it will hurt you. So just don't. Um, so both the US and Europe have some pretty stringent safety standards if you're looking to set up some protocols for your venue on how to safely service items or how to check things when you're troubleshooting to look at wiring, things like that. You can often look to the NFPA or Electricity at Work Gener uh, regulations in the UK to give you some guidelines on safety standards. Um, one of the things we do want to mention is if you're going to be troubleshooting things inside of your dimmer rack, you should be locking out and tagging out. This means that you should have control of the power source. They make little devices you can hook onto a circuit breaker and put a physical lock onto. You should be the only person who can unlock that lock, thus ensuring that if you flip the breaker off, no one else can turn it back on until you say so. So if you have your hand in the rack, no one's gonna flip that breaker back on and get that power in, right? So never work in a live rack. I can't say it enough. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the phone with people and I hear it zap. Don't do it. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to talk about some tools that you can use to troubleshoot in your system. Now that we know about how data is getting everywhere in your system, we can talk about how to figure out why things aren't working correctly. And one of these things is about. So in almost all of our devices, we have a menu called about that can give you information surprisingly about what's happening. So in, as you see in this first image, this is about dimmer. This is actually a screenshot from CEM3. I'm looking for information about circuit 3, and it can tell me that it is in rack 3, which happens to be my desk's CEM, um, and that its current level is 0% with no control source. If I were trying to figure out why this dimmer was not turning on, I can look in this menu and see, well, no one's telling it to turn on. It's not receiving any data to turn on right now. The bottom image is the about menu from EOS, and it is showing information about channel two, which is currently patched as a color source par, and the current values for that. So I can see that manual levels have set my intensity to full. Okay. 
Um, and I think if you can make it go over there, we can show you some more stuff. So in about on an EOS family console, you can also see about network devices. This can tell you about other devices currently on your network, whether they are currently connected or have been seen on the network and are no longer currently connected. So this is kind of a snapshot of other ACN devices that were on our network recently. Um, and we've also got ETC Nomad running here and an RFR that we can connect. This is about console. This tells us about our specific desk. So right now we're running EOS ETC Nomad on this laptop. So it's giving it us information about that. You can see we actually have a dongle connected and the system count shows 2048. So that's to show you that this unit with that dongle plugged in is capable of outputting 2048 unique DMX addresses. So you can use this to troubleshoot a variation of things that might happen with your console. Oh, I have a laser pointer, I keep forgetting. Hey, including showing the IP address that your machine is currently set to. So if you're seeing that you can't configure things, but you can send SACN data, you can check your IP here. Or if you're not getting any data out at all, and you see no network available, that's probably your problem. And so again, check the blinky light on the back of the port to make sure it's actually plugged in and active. <laughs> so uh, there is a plethora of information that you can get from the about menus. Uh, CEM3 has about, Paradigm has about, all of our consoles have about, so Cobalt Color Source and EOS Family consoles have about menus. Um, CEM Plus, CEM Classic, so all your older sensor racks you might have also have about. Unison Legacy does not have an about, but we have some very buried things that we can do to help figure out if data is getting from point A to point B. Don't hesitate to give us a call. So, again, configuration files. These can be your friend when you're troubleshooting. Always keep a backup file. Can't drum that into you enough. Like, this is probably second after not getting debt and sticking your hands in a rack. <laughs> um, you just want to save as early as you can and as often as you can. So as soon as you start patching your console, save it. Even if it's every 10 minutes. You may have saved yourself 10 minutes work. It's something you can go back to later. So if you find you've got a problem, one day when you come in, you know the show was good last night, somebody's come in and changed something, so just go back to last night's version. You've got a backup. Load it again. That's a troubleshooting tip. You know, you go back to your last known good state. So always put yourself back where you were before. The same with if you're changing cabling or something like that. You've moved something. Just go back to the known good state and try again from there. So uh, once you've saved a backup, you can always load it again. A couple of things about sort of configuration files as well. They kind of need to match each other. So if you've got two systems working together, for example here you have an architectural control system and you have a console. You're feeding data through the architectural system so that it can snapshot it maybe. A lot of systems, paradigm systems maybe, will have the option to record um, a look and then play it back from the button station. So you run up the console, you set your look and you record it. So it's taking the data through the paradigm system. If those fixtures that you're controlling aren't patched in your paradigm system, then it's not going to snapshot it. So those two configuration files need to match. The console patch needs to match the paradigm patch. So again, that's your configuration file. If one of them's been changed in some way, then things might stop working. Net3 concert. Who knows what Net3 concert is? Not a lot of people, so yeah, OK. That's good. We're going to show it to you. <laughs> uh, Net3 Concert is a piece of software. So in the past, we've had lots of pieces of software to configure lots of different devices, which is a bit of a pain when you're doing tech support or field service. Uh, you're constantly working out which bit of software you need for the next device that you need to configure. Uh, Net3 Concert is your friend now because it does most of our devices. So you can configure your sensor racks through here. You can configure your gateways. You can configure your RDM fixtures. You will see some other devices on the network, maybe not configurable, but it will show you that they're there. It will show you some errors on the network. It will show you if things are synchronized or not synchronized. So you can see lots of things, and it also allows you to save the configuration from all those devices. So you've got one place where you've stored your dimmer configuration. If you've got through power modules and you're changing them on a week-by-week -week basis, if you work in a rep house, you want to go back to the same show again, you can just push that configuration out from Net3 Concert to your gateways, to your dimmer racks, um, and reset your system as it was. So again, if you've saved a Net3 Concert file as a backup, that'll put you in a good known state again. 
get your whole Net3 system back in the same line all with one program. So this is uh, a little screenshot of Net3 Constant. I'll open it up in a minute as well. But it basically adds in all the devices as icons that it's found. So it's a big network here with green lines drawn out, all the network lines. And you can see the little uh, XLR connectors there are gateways, so two ports or four ports. You can see an I.O. gateway in here. Uh, the little icon on the left-hand side there is concert, so that's actually the computer and its IP address as well, so you can see what that is. If you run multiple computers with concert on the same network, that's fine. People can be configuring lots of different areas of your network at once with two different computers. So you'll see another icon, so you know that you've got a friend online who may be changing things, which is why stuff isn't working. Um, you'll see down the bottom right-hand side, you've got some paradigm equipment there. You can't configure that from here, but you can see that it's there and it's online. You've got various icons, the little um, LED icon in the bottom right corner of most of these. So top left-hand side, in-sync icon, little green one, out-of-sync icon. So that means that the configuration in the device is different to the configuration in your computer in Net3 Concert. So you either need to pull the configuration back from the device, if that's the good one, or send it from Concert to the device. You can send configuration files for individual devices or for the whole system. Obviously, you'd be a little bit careful with the whole system. Make sure you know you're sending the right file to your whole system. Um, but you can do that individually. Again, we're doing a course on concepts. Some of you may be going to it, so I'm not going to go too much into depth. But it's a really neat program. Um, How many people have overlap between this and the network track? A lot of you, right? OK, that's what we thought. <laughs> there's not much on this network right now. But I'm just going to drag this in so you can see. Uh, on my other screen, but you get a little pop-up when you open Concert, which says, what do you want to do? Do you want to open an existing project? Um, or do something called Network Map, which is really cool. If you just walk into a building and you want to start reconfiguring their gateways, you don't have their configuration, you just click on Network Map. And in a minute, I'm going to have to drag this over to the screen for you. It's doing it down here right now. It's having a search around the network, see which devices it can find. And then it drags them all in. All you missed was a little thinking icon. Just a little uh, bar. So actually, it's only finding three devices here. One's my computer, one's the Paradigm processor, and one's the sensor rack, which I think it's still retrieving the configuration from and right now. It thinks it's rack two. Hey. It thinks it's rack two. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can also configure offline here. Uh, so you can add all your gateways in, add your sensor racks in, configure them before you get into the venue, and then just push it out to them from here. Um, so it's really simple to just Go to the device library and drag in a four port gateway and double click on it and configure what the ports do. Really simple graphical interface. And again, with a sensor rack, you can double click it to open it. You can add another sensor rack, sensor CM plus and sensor three. You can configure from here. Sensor um, classic only DMX, so there's no way for us to network in and configure it from here. And you'll see you've got uh, RDM devices here as well. Sasha mentioned RDM earlier, so that's a way of communicating with DMX devices over the DMX line, error reporting from them, and reconfiguring them. So color source fixtures, source for LED fixtures, are all RDM devices. So you can readdress them and change their modes over RDM. You can either do that from the console, if it's an EOS or a Cobalt, or you can do it through here. So this is like a management program for your system. It means your console operator doesn't have to stop and exit out and launch Net3 Concert to do these things. You can do it from a laptop. So if you did have an RDM device connected, you'd just see another line drawn out of the gateway from where it was connected to an icon for a fixture like this, um, which again, you can double click on and reconfigure. You'll see a property editor over here with some of its settings, start address, etc. You can change that. And then when you get there, you can send that to a specific fixture. So all these are good backup files. We're not saving for some reason. I'm not going to save it because I don't need it. <laughs> so what's next? There you go. All right. Let's see. So some troubleshooting scenarios now that we've learned a little bit about the data and the tools for finding problems. Let's talk about sometimes you might have problems. For example, a lot of times when we get calls, it'll be because someone has a lack of control, no control over their system, or no control over certain components in their system. Um, so one of the first things you want to find out in that sort of scenario is 
what's my data type and what's the path it takes. If you don't know these things, you can find them out often by looking at your drawings or taking a look at the settings for your devices. Um, so, is this a DMX output from my console? Is there an XLR cable plugged into the DMX port on the back or not? If there's not, should there be one? <laughs> <laughs> High impedance air gap is the problem. Um, otherwise, should it be network? If it is network, is there a network cable plugged in? Is there activity on that network port? Are my IP settings correct? How does the line from point A to point B get run? Can I look at my drawings and see if there's a device in between my console and my receiving device, maybe like a DMX repeater or opto splitter that might be malfunctioning and not letting the data get through to the end? Right? So specifically with DMX, when we're troubleshooting DMX on an XLR cable getting out of our console, we know that we only have the one universe and one DMX line. So we can say, what happens if we try another source? Do I have another console? Or perhaps do I have a different port on the same console that I can try output from? Sometimes we do see over voltage on a DMX line causing damage to the circuitry inside our sending device that can stop sending. Right? Um, what, so what happens when we use another source? Do our lights start responding? You've probably got a problem on your sending end. Uh, what happens if we change DMX addresses? So. If I have a fixture out in the field and it's set to DMX address 30 and I have no control over it, what happens if I change it to the same address as a working fixture? Do they now work together? If they do, I might have a problem with my patch at my console. Um, so changing DMX addresses to known working addresses can help you if you're troubleshooting a lack of control on specific devices. Um, if you have a great toolkit, you can use your DMX tester. Plug it right in there. Do you see data coming out? Is it flickering? Is it on the correct addresses? All of these things can help you figure out why you don't have control in one point or another. So it's not DMX. We're not doing DMX anymore. We've moved to a huge network infrastructure. Everything's going out of our network, out of our console, and into a switch and all over everything, but I can't control some stuff. Concert, which we just showed you, is a great way to troubleshoot that. So you saw when he added in a gateway to the configuration, it had a big X over it because it wasn't currently online. If you've saved your concert configuration and you open it up and you see X's on three or four gateways and they correspond with what you can't control, those are not currently on the network. You want to go check them, make sure they have power, make sure they're still properly plugged in. Sneaky hands on catwalks do all kinds of stuff and I think we've all experienced that. Um, can you ping it? So um, when we're networking, we can do something called ping. And ping sends out a little message on the network that says, I think there's a device at this address. Are you there and can you respond? If you don't get a response back, there's something in the network preventing you from getting stuff from point A to point B. And a ping goes out regardless of your subnet. So if you're physically on the same network, you should be able to get a ping across. So on a Windows device, you can choose the run command and open a command prompt. So that's CMD in the run command. Uh, which is open oh, which yeah. just like flipped itself. And it's going to open up a really awesome window that doesn't seem to want to come onto the projector because we're having bad luck today. Here we go. All right. And you can ping from here by typing ping and then the IP of the device that you think you should be able to talk to. This requires you to know that IP address, so it's always a good idea in your system to keep a record of what the IP addresses of your devices should be. So right now we're saying ping and we're getting a reply. Huh? Unreachable. Uh, unreachable. We can't talk to that device. So we'd say, all right, there is not a connection between us and that device now. We can start troubleshooting on the network to figure out why we can't get that data from point A to point B. Perhaps Graham can figure oh, out. No, I'm just going to check the <laughs> IP address. Uh, in fact, you Perhaps see, the device is set to an IP address different because, than the one you were pinging. Because it's Rack 2, which I know because I looked in concert and it said Rack 2, I'm actually pinging the wrong IP address here. I'm pinging 10.101.101.101. Uh, and so going back to earlier when we mentioned there's a chart of IP address defaults, this can also be helpful. If you do not know the IPs in your system, they do ship with a specific set of IPs, which can help you guess a little bit at where things might need to be. So in this case, now we are getting a reply. We can see that we do have a network path from our laptop to the CEM3. So if we're not getting data, it's something other than the physical network. We'll start looking at subnets and IP addresses. Right? Um, you can also ping from any of our EOS family or Cobalt family consoles out in the system settings. There is a little box that says ping, click it, 
enter the IP address and off you go. So this is a tool that is available for you from your sending device in order to check. Um, can you see data via a sniffer? So earlier we mentioned Art Net Dominator. You can see how weirdly that's spelled and, and it's really complicated and we hope we're pronouncing it correctly. Um, but there's also a great program you've heard mention of called SACN View, which was developed by Tom Steer and some other people here at ETC, but is not an ETC program. So the company does not own this program. Tom made it himself, he owns it. So this program is made to be on your Net3 network and it can see SACN on the network and tell you the current priority and levels being sent by each device on your network. So when you open it up, you see your universes and underneath those, the sources within that universe. Okay, so if you double click on universe one right now, you're gonna get a chart of all 512 addresses in that universe, which goes back to how DMX used to work. We've carried that forward into our network protocols. And you can see a color-coded guide to what sources are sending data now. So as you can see, we have three sources. Their priority is all 100, and they are sending different level data right now. Because they all have the same priority, the highest levels are winning, which is why you're seeing the pink 255s winning out over here. There's an interesting thing here. You probably can't see it. Sorry, it's really small. But uh, those who can, the IP address fields here, it's showing you the IP of the device that's sending. The thing to notice there is that two of them are 10101. One of them is 169254 something something. It's in a different subnet range. But we're still seeing it, which is what I was saying earlier about multicast and SACN. It's getting through anyway. So my computer is in a 10101 range, but it's still receiving that SACN data. So I can see it there. But that's a good tip to say, ah, I can see it here, but actually it's the wrong IP range. If you open up this program and you see no data, then your sending device is likely not sending data on your network at this time. Or your SACN device is in a different IP and subnet as well. Although it is multicast, so you should be able to see it regardless. So then you'd start pinging. You can also click this handy icon here, which is a SACN source. So actually this is transmitting streaming ACN. So if you don't have your console out the box yet, but you've got your laptop there, or there's something wrong with your console, you just want to flash through your rig, you can actually use the transmit function here in various ways. You've got faders. Uh, if I click start, you'll see another streaming ACN source appears here, which is SACN view. And you've got faders for a universe there. You've got channel check. Oh, look. <laughs> So you can actually use this as a source to flash out. Really good for a production electrician if they just want to get on the network, turn some lights on um, because the console op's busy doing something else. They may not thank you for it. You can, you can get on their network and you can play with their stuff. It's a very handy troubleshooting tool, and I believe in the network course they'll teach you more about it. Where can you get SACN View? SACN View is a free program and is available, I believe, through GitHub right now, but if you do Google SACN view, it will be your first hit. We've searched it and clicked it a bunch to make sure. <laughs> um, so when we're troubleshooting a lack of control, one of the things to consider is, are the lighting fixtures stuck on or stuck off? These can tell us two different things, right? So if the lights are all off, maybe we don't have data coming out of things. But if they're on, something is sending data on the system, what is it? Is our Arch system set to a higher priority than our console? Did someone hit a preset in the back of the room and then not tell you and then leave? So, <laughs> the lights are stuck on. The first thing I would do is press off on my paradigm system. <laughs> um, if you shut down the console and all your lights stay on, your console's probably not your source of data, right? So consider lights stuck on or lights stuck off, no data versus an abundance of data where we don't want it when trying to track down a problem. Speaking of problems, flickers. So you're going to see probably a flicker at times on some fixtures. It's really open to interpretation as to what that flicker may be. What kind of flicker is it? Is it a fast um, continuous flicker? Is it an occasional random flicker? Um, does it feel like it's happening at the same interval all the time? What's going on when, it's, when the flicker is happening? Is there something specific happening? Uh, you're going to look in the unusual loads course next with Mark at uh, a glossary of terms. So you can help define that flicker. So if you call us up, you can kind of describe the flicker a little bit better. Um, but there's various things that might be causing a flicker. Um, bad cables, 
Y splits, so we're talking DMX here. DMX is supposed to daisy chain between fixtures. You're not supposed to put Y splits into it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, if you want to split DMX, then you need to use an opto splitter, ideally, um, and then go off in different directions from there. So that can be causing reflections back down the line, which is affecting the data. Uh, the device is reading the data wrong then, and it's causing it to flicker. Too many fixtures on the DMX line. 32 devices is the limit <coughs> on one DMX line. If you have an opto splitter, then 32 devices on each line out of the splitter. But if you put more devices than that on the line, then you might be in for trouble. You might be starting to see flickers or some fixtures not working. That's the limit within the protocol. Uh, bad wiring installation. So yeah, you might have bad cables if you're just running in XLR cables between fixtures. But it might actually be the installation in the wall. If you plug into a jack in the wall, if you've got a new building, don't just assume that the installer has tested all those DMX lines. They may not have done. They may have told you they did, but they didn't. Um, so it might be the wire in the wall that's default. And there may be a big cut in the wire from when they put the back box in or something like that. RDM is a big one. So RDM is great. You can readdress your fixtures. You can change their mode. You can get information about them. Um, it's really cool. But some devices, some DMX devices, aren't necessarily listening to the right start code um, within the DMX protocol. Um, and they can listen and hear an RDM packet and think that's a DMX packet and try and set a level from it effectively. So they're going to start flickering because they're seeing RDM information and they think it's DMX levels coming in. So you might see that quite a lot. Um, turn, off DM, uh, turn off RDM. You can turn it off on a gateway. You can turn it off on the local ports on the console. Try that first and then see if that stops the flickering. Mainly the things that are going to flicker here are probably cheaper fixtures. Your cheap say. Chinese LED. Oh, I wasn't going to say that. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> I wanted to say it. I wasn't allowed to say Chinese. <laughs> um, cheaper fixtures, which may not have implemented DMX correctly, um, and older devices. So really old DMX dimmers, maybe. Um, just some devices that were around before RDM, and it wasn't a problem back then. An RDM so. flicker, just as a note, is almost always going to present as like a heartbeat type of flicker, a flash that's really consistent because RDM data is interwoven between those packets really consistently. So if you're getting like a flash flash break for a while and then flash flash break for a while, it's probably not RDM. Just a little example. Is this good or is this bad? This was a site I went to. I actually went to this site because they had a bunch of uh, track fixtures. They had some Iridium fixtures in tracks. Um, uh, lots of them in this room, and they were all flickering. Mm, particularly randomly, there was no real pattern to it, um, and I had to go and do an overnight on this site, which was about to open, and find out why all their fixtures were flickering. Uh, after a couple of hours of opening up boxes and looking at cabling, testing various things, I found some boxes like this. So these boxes have mains cables running through them. You can see they're just using little ch connector blocks here. The wiring they're using for the DMX is actually suitable for DMX, um, but they're connecting it via terminal blocks. They're running it next to live um, 230 volt wiring. There's no shield on some of the DMX. Um, it's asking for trouble, really. And the connections are not great at all. Not only was it badly wired, there were Y splits. So they were going into tracks, um, which were U-shaped, and they were coming in in one corner of the track and splitting. So there were like seven or eight Y splits in the room. None of the DMX was terminated. So do you know about terminating DMX? You put a 110 ohm resistor on the end of your DMX line, that terminates it and stops the reflections down the line. None of it was terminated at all. It was split all over the place. Um, so pretty much everything was wrong here. They had more than 32 fixtures on the line as well. So as we slowly started to remove some of these problems, suddenly it settled down and wasn't flickering anymore. But this took me most of a night to troubleshoot probably about four or five hours, because there were so many faults on the line. So Yeah, that was not much fun. Did you fix it all that time, or was that just to troubleshoot it, and then it had to be fixed? I, I fixed it by just rewiring the Y splits and things, but it was never any great. Um, we had to take a couple of fixtures out, and it wasn't left properly fixed, but the, the contractors would have had to come back and rewire it properly. But we made it work, so it wasn't flickering anymore, but just the time spent taking boxes apart, looking at wiring. So could be anywhere. Um, this was all of those things, but any one of those things can cause a flicker. So 
through all of this with all of these tricks and tips and things that you can look at, keep in mind that we're only a call away. No matter where you are in the world, ETC tech support is 24-7 every day of the year. We don't care if it's a holiday, we're always happy to answer your call. Here are the phone numbers to reach us worldwide. Um, so really, uh, we hope that this class can give you some ideas and information that you might want to gather before you call us, but never feel like the information in this class was supposed to replace help. We always are happy to help you, whether it's me here in the US or our friends across the pond. And uh, I would say also, if you're, if you're across the pond and it's like the middle of the night and you're worried about waking someone up in the UK, you can always call us here in the United States as well, um, and vice versa. <laughs> All right, so uh, top 10 calls from tech support. Um, <laughs> I am not Johnny Carson, but I'm gonna try this anyway. <laughs> All right, so number one. Lack of console control. I turned on my geo, but my lights don't work. So, what did we go over earlier that we might look for in this scenario? Yeah, line yes, <laughs> excellent. What else? Some other awesome. Yes, it's some other controller taking precedence. Great thing to look for. Anything else? Is the DMX line plugged in on both ends? <laughs> yes, is the DMX line plugged in on both ends? This is awesome. Is the rack powered up? Is the rack powered up? Great. My boss called me on my off day and the Grand Master was down. <laughs> I'm really sorry that happened to you. Yeah, check the Grand Master. <laughs> one, of, one of my colleagues in the UK, he actually works over here, he's, he is American, but he's back over here now. He worked in field service in the UK and he flew to, I think, Greece or Spain or somewhere to troubleshoot a problem, which was the Grand Master was down. <laughs> but he flew all the way there. Uh, is there a patch is a fun one. Um, so you might have the Grandmaster up, all of your DMX cables plugged in, but if you started a new show and you didn't patch anything, your data has no idea where to go. Um, anything else anyone can think of? Park menu. Park menu. Awesome. How many times have you guys accidentally parked something at zero? Like I think a lot of us have done that, right? Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> a lack of architectural control. So this would be the, I push the buttons and the lights don't turn on, right? So what would you guys look at if you went to turn on system from Paradigm and the lights turned on? The breaker, are you locked out? Do you guys know what your button stations do when they're locked out? The red. Yours turn red? Great, so that is programmable. Uh, I don't, Paradigm is hugely customizable, but we try and keep a standard, so we've told our technicians when they're installing them that lockout should either be everything's red or everything blinks, so that you have a indi visual indicator that you're in the lockout state. Yes? I've got uh, button stations that like to drop off the network. They drop off, and then they do the waterfall. That's the first thing I go to, is if I start pushing buttons and what they have, uh, you'll find out a whole station, a whole button station. I think that's a great thing, yeah. And when stations are offline, they either won't light at all, or they'll do what we call a, a waterfall cascade, where button one will light, then button two, then button three, and so on, to indicate that they're not talking to their processing unit. So then, we'd go check the processor, and make sure the breaker was on, and that it was powered on. Um, definitely had a lot of times where you push a button, nothing happens, and it's because someone is actively servicing your paradigm system. Sometimes my, uh, if the power goes out and it goes back on, the LCD screen will come back up. So if I go back and just restart, reboot the, the paradigm, it'll come back up. So yep. for some reason, initially, it just won't start it. So once the blue moon. Okay. I'm going to sneak past you here, okay? Good. You'll find um, problems like that with stations going offline. Again, they could be bad cables. There is like a, a cable length limit within Paradigm. Um, and if they're right on the limit, the amount of cable in the system, then they may work one day and the next day they may not. So again, it may go back to the installation originally. Um, and if it's always been like that, then it could be an installation problem. It's not just a fault that's occurring now. So you could need to go back all the way to the installation stage to try and troubleshoot that. Absolutely. Uh, reset can do a whole lot. So you were mentioning resetting when that went fine. Um, just so you know, the reset button on the front of a Paradigm processor is this tiny little hole that's just to the right of this USB port. You're welcome to come on up at the end of the class and take a closer look if you want. I, don't, I know a lot of you back there probably can't see this at all. Um, it is a pinhole, so bring your favorite paper clip or bobby pin with you to the rack. 
and I, on that it made me nervous because uh, on like a router, for instance, if you hold that thing down, you reset all of the settings and everything. Like you completely factory reset it. And so it always made me nervous to push that, but then when I talk to, to technical You can push and hold that till you turn blue, exactly. it's just gonna reboot. That's what made me so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just do a soft <laughs> reboot, It's just a soft reboot. So really it's going to it's gonna do an internal power cycle of the processor. So keep my USB stick ready. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a backup. Back up your configuration and you can always reload it by a USB stick if anything does go wrong. Unison legacy racks have a little purple reset square. It's labeled reset, you tap it, it reboots. Uh, configurations for Unison Legacy can be reloaded using a floppy disk. <laughs> if you can still find three and a half inch floppies and you have a Unison system, buy them now. I think they're not gonna be around for long. <laughs> or save up for a paradigm upgrade and get some USB. <laughs> Uh, you guys sell yeah, we do. Yes, have some we do. Still sell Our pricing no. might be a little higher than you might find online if you can find them online. <laughs> but if you need them, they are around. Uh, we also sell SD cards and USB sticks. So anything that you need to back up your configurations, you can find through ETC or elsewhere. Number three dimming rack errors. This light at the top of the rack, which is blue on sensor plus and sensor three, and is like moderately blinding when you have the rack door open, is what we call the beacon. And when your rack is experiencing an error, the beacon will flash. That's to tell you, hey, you're walking by this rack and you probably didn't know, but I have an error message. Um, dimmer rack errors can happen for a variety of reasons, and if you read the message, it will tell you why. No, this is really hard to believe. <laughs> um, so uh, on all of our CEMs, except for the original MPE, which is really, really old touring rack thing, there is a screen. And the screen has English information on it that tells you what's going on, or Spanish, or German, depending on what you set it to. The error will tell you why something's not working. So say you walk by your rack, and everything's been working fine, and you notice a flashing beacon, you open the rack door, and it says, no data port A. Anyone know why you might have that error message? Your console is powered off. <laughs> Don't worry about it. If your console is on and someone's trying to program and they can't control the lights and you have no data port A error, you've got a problem. Something, you know, DMX isn't coming out or it's not getting received. But if you see no data port A and everything works normally and your board's turned off, it's because your board's turned off. You can't send data when there's no power. Um, you will see errors occasionally phase A, phase B, phase C, either off or low. First thing you can do to troubleshoot that is break the rack off and break it back on so we can get a fresh sense of the power feed. If that error keeps coming up, call your local electrician. It's time to figure out why your power is bad. If the local electrician confirms that the power is good and you are still getting these errors, give us a ring and we'll happily repair your sensor CEM, which apparently is no longer sensing voltage correctly. Um, most of the errors we see on racks are either data errors or voltage errors. Occasionally we do see other more specific errors like arch config failed to load, which might be something on your paradigm processor, which you could then resolve by reloading your configuration from USB because you saved it and backed it up. Or a physical, a physical, a physical problem with the rack too. So over temp. We have uh, too high of a temperature on a specific dimmer module. That can be from too much load. Ooh, water in the rack is a big problem. There's definitely not a specific error message that says water in the rack. <laughs> but he said no, because it shorted out the TMX circuit. If you're getting every conceivable error, power down your rack and check for water damage. <laughs> Uh, for, we have power issues. Uh, does the CEM in the rack log power anomalies as they go? It does not log as it goes, but if you have your CEM3 connected to a system with a NET3 conductor, that will log it. it can log. Okay. So NET3 conductor will log and send you messages about any errors in your system. So you can be sleeping tight at home, and when the power goes out, you can get a text message or an email to let you know that it happened. It's pretty handy. I have, a, I have a sense of the power company. <laughs> But they're not going to really care about the no DMX port A error that happened when you turned off your board. <laughs> Number four, issues with data translation. 
This is my fancy way of saying my gateways on the network, but no DMX is coming out. Um, or my net2 node is on the network, but no, no, no DMX is coming out. Either way, sometimes we have one type of data, we're changing it to another type of data, and it doesn't work correctly. I actually see this a lot in systems where people have input nodes, where someone's taking their console and plugging DMX in, and then expect network to come out on the other side, but they never configured the device's network settings. So, remember, when an issue is with data translation to or from network, check your network settings, make sure everyone's on the network and can be pinged, check out SACN view, net to utilities, art no nominator, I'm gonna pronounce it right someday. <laughs> Number five. Unbound arch stations. So you guys brought this up already. We kind of talked about it. And you see that waterfall, your stations aren't talking. A lot of times the problem is at your processor and not at the station. So go ahead and check out your arch processor, whether it's Paradigm, Unison, dare I mention digital address or analog address systems. These things still exist. And if they're not talking to their stations, the processor is typically the issue. So. The number one thing we're going to have you do is try and manually bind them. So if you give us a call, we'll walk you through going into the processor and telling it, hey stations, I want to talk to you. Number two thing is usually a reboot. And number three thing is going to be reloading your configuration file. There are times when all of these things fail. And if you've been struck by lightning, that's probably why. So um, too much voltage on anything can kill the circuits that we use to talk between things. So no more data is going to be traveling down those lines, even though voltage might be present and that can cause those failures. If you're in that situation, call tech support, we'll get you a loaner processor, get you right back up and running. Number six, multi-console systems. Who here has had to call us because you couldn't get your backup talking to your primary? They say you're hiding if you're not raising your hands because I'm getting the call. <laughs> We send them out with IPs that are supposed to allow you to plug them into the same network and get them talking immediately. That being said, every geo console in the world ships out with the same default IPs, so two geos, if you don't change the IP on one, have identical IP addresses and won't be able to talk to each other. Change the last octet by one number and your problem is solved. Um, keep in mind that consoles need to be running the exact same software version and the exact same fixture library version in order to communicate with each other. Otherwise, when they try and hand each other show file information, there are components they might not understand. Like a fixture, it has no idea what it is, or a feature that we've introduced in newer software that can't be read by the older software. They have to, have to, have to match. And this also comes down to when Graham was talking about keeping things in the right subnet. You might get SACN communication to everything in your network, but we use Unicast on Net3 to talk between consoles, so they have to be in the same IP range and subnet to talk to each other. Number seven, how do I set up the network to begin with? <laughs> Good question. So uh, I think through a bunch of classes today, you guys have all heard the network switch as the hub in your system and all of your network lines as the spokes. That's the number one thing. So a lot of times people say, I have two devices. I'm just going to take a Cat5 cable and I'm plugging in on this end and plugging in on this end. And a lot of times that's going to work. But then you have to think about who powers on first to make sure that network ports are active. If there's a network, port, a network switch in your system, alive and active at all times, then anything you plug into it is automatically going to say, ooh, a network connection, I love those, and be happily talking on the network, okay? Um, so if you call me and you ask how to create a network, the number, thing I'm, number one thing I'm going to say is, let's get you a network switch. You need to purchase one of those. Go ahead and go out to your favorite electronics store and purchase an unmanaged network switch. That's a great way to start. The number of ports matches the number of devices that you want to connect, plus some if you want room to grow. Right. Number eight, which mode should I use? So um, if you guys have used our LED fixtures, you might notice they all have like a bajillion different settings. That's because every use case needs a different set of settings to get optimal performance. And it is totally okay to call tech support and say, here's what I want to do with my fixture, what mode should I put it in? We're more than happy to help. There are all kinds of reasons to pick one mode versus the other. Maybe you don't need strobe and you only have a universe that you can control to begin with, so let's take you down to a mode that doesn't have strobes, so you're not wasting addresses. Or maybe you need the absolute best color control no matter what because it's really important that that psych is that perfect, perfect blue. And we're gonna get you into direct mode so that you can get really 
granular color control. Um, also, keeping in mind what your control source is can help a lot. Some consoles cannot handle our seven color mixing system so greatly. So we might push you into an RGB mode so that the processing inside the fixture can do that tr color translation for you instead of the other manufacturer's console. Number nine, how do I do whatever? <laughs> I think a lot of people consider technical support the thing to call when something is broken. But please keep in mind that you can always call us when you're just curious about how to make something happen. We're always happy to help you guys, even if it's, I just really want to write a cool effect today. We're going to walk you through all the steps we can to get you the effect you want on your stage. We all love theater and amusement parks and basically anything lighting related, so we're always happy to help you. And the big whopper number 10. <laughs> IRFR and ARFR setup accounts for a lot of the calls we get, so we're going to spend the rest of the class talking about that. <laughs> uh, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, so how to connect your router or WAP wireless access point. So there's two devices which you can use to get a wireless network. Um, a router is uh, a device which I showed you here earlier, which will allow two networks to talk to each other. You don't need one of those, um, but it's pretty useful. It's pretty quick and easy to set up. Wireless access point is just a device which you put on one network. It effectively converts your wired network to wireless. So there's less setup involved there, potentially. Um, but actually, with a router, there is pretty much no setup if you use it out of the box in factory default state. Um, this is actually in factory default state right now, and I don't have to do anything to it. So you'll see on the back of here, there's two network connections. There's internet, this is just a domestic version, and four ethernet connections. They may be labeled WAN, W-A-N, wireless area network, sorry, wide area network, uh, or LAN, local area network. So the four ports would probably be the LAN network. So the wireless part of the network here, and these four ports, that's all the LAN, the local area network. And this single connector is the wider area network. So this is designed to be in your house, connected to the internet on the one port, and then everything else in your house, your computers and your iPads, will go via the wireless network or this wired network here, and that's the local area network. You can use this. Uh, most people use domestic routers in their theaters. Uh, you could use something bigger and more professional, but this will probably work in a small space pretty well. So I've plugged the console here into the one port. The console has DHCP turned on, so we didn't really talk about this, but DHCP is dynamic host control protocol. Um, the most important part of that protocol is that it will give out IP addresses. So if you've looked in the network settings of your console, you probably would have found that there is a little tick box for the network port, which is DHCP. If you tick that and turn it on, um, it should have an address field below it, IP address field, which by default would be set to 10.101.50.101. So any device which comes on the network can send out some packets and say, is there a DHCP server out there? Can you give me an IP address for this network, please? So that's how your laptop works when you go to Starbucks and connect to their wireless. You connect to the wireless, uh, it sends out a little message and says, can I have an IP address, please, for your wireless network? And their access point, or their router, or whatever it is in the system that's serving DHCP addresses will send an IP address to your laptop. It'll hold on to it whilst you're on that network and then it'll just give it up, and the next network you connect to, it'll get another one. So DHCP is really useful. Some people will keep it turned off in their systems because they'll set static IP addresses on all their devices. But for connecting wireless devices, that's really useful. So we're sending DHCP from here. So I've plugged this device in, just like you would plug this into the internet connection coming into your house. That would go out to your internet service provider and say, can I have an IP address for the internet, please? It's doing the same thing here. It's going to the console and saying, give me an IP address. It's getting an IP address, it's going to get 10.101.50 something on the wider area network port. The default setup in here for the LAN ports um, is a different IP range, but it's a router, remember? So it's routing the traffic between those two networks. So actually they don't need to have the same IP addresses. This acts as a DHCP server on the LAN network. So IP address from console into here on the WAN network routing the traffic through onto the LAN network, also giving out DHCP addresses. So I can connect my laptop as a client, I can connect my iPhone, 
and ask for a, an IP address from this device. It'd be a completely different IP range subnet, but it doesn't matter because the traffic is being routed between the two networks within here, which makes this really easy to set up. Um, that's designed to be easy to set up in your house. So I haven't actually done anything to this at all. Um, just have a little look at what we've got. Most of these devices you can set up by web browsing into. So I've actually... You've got five minutes, Graham. Okay. We'll see you now. I'll be quick. So <laughs> I've used Internet Explorer here. Um, out of the box, this device, and I can start that again so you can see. Um, the manual for this device will tell me that it's... Uh, standard static IP address is 192.168.11. A lot of um, domestic devices are the same. So within Internet Explorer, when I'm connected to the wireless network, 192.168.1.1. Username and password. Normally, it's admin. In Always consult devices. the manual for your router. The manual will tell you, or the internet will tell you. Uh, in this case, it's admin, admin. You can change this if you're setting it up yourself. Uh, it'll take a minute over the wireless just to connect. It's going to connect to the device, and it's going to give me the setup page for this device. I'm not going to change anything because the default out of the factory setup works if I connect via those two different networks. But just so you can see, it's pretty slow on the wireless, actually, this. We have a lot of wireless traffic in this building right now. Yeah. I don't know if any of you have tried to connect to Wi-Fi today. <laughs> it's going to not do it now, isn't it? Well, it's going to be real cranky with you. Yeah, it did take a minute earlier. Um, I just want to show you here the different IP addresses on the two different sides of the network, if it will actually connect for me. Essentially, it was showing, so if it will show, um, oh. that it'll show the IP address it received from the console, and it'll show you the first IP address it will hand out to anything it's routing data to on the network. There we go. Hey, there we go. Can so you this zoom? is the setup page. It's, it's pretty small. Sorry about that. But in the setup here, uh, this is actually setting up this device for the LAN network. So it's actually got automatic configuration DHCP turned on, and it says IP address 192.168.11. So that's the IP address of this device, which I've just browsed into. Um, it's serving out DHCP addresses. Uh, I don't think it actually tells us there. Yeah, it does. There you go. DHCP server is enabled, starting with 192.168.1.100. Um, so that's what it's going to start giving out addresses to, to anybody who connects to this network. So you'll see the network. You can probably all see it. It's called Linksys something if you get your phone out. It's not secured. You can connect to it if you like. Uh, it's probably going to cause me more problems, though, so maybe not. Let's we'll see how many people can IRFR into this geo today. We'll just go through that. So I'm just looking at the status here. Um, okay. And this is telling me down here. This is the internet IP address. It's not really the internet, um, but it's 10.101.50.111. And that's the IP address it's got from the geo on the WAN side, the wider area network side. So it's been given an address by the geo. It's routing the traffic through oh, 192.168. I just hate trackpad so much. Hey, it's huge. <laughs> so actually, that's a really easy setup. We have not done any that's a really easy setup. We have not done any configuration here. I'm just showing you what it's done automatically. So all you've needed to do is turn on DHCP on your console. And you do it on one device in your network. Don't have four DHCP servers in the network. <laughs> one device in control of IP addresses. Um, so you may need to turn that on on the console. Does it default to DHCP on, on port one? Yes. Yeah. Port one so defaults on to anyway. DHCP enabled on 10 .1 Again, .1 something to look out for. If you buy two geos, turn it off on one of them. Um, so the router is going to translate through the network for you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Default out of the box. It's ready yep. to say. It varies a lot, and this is why it's a really frequent tech support call. Because to be honest we, with you, the only ones I've had trouble where you can't just default it are airports. Apple airports are weird, weird things. Just remember when you call us, we know nothing about your device here because you just bought it from the shop. and. We get calls about so many different devices. The first thing I ask is, what's the device? Have you set it up yet? Have you done anything to it? Probably I'll tell you to factory default it again, if you have. Um, and then I can open up the manual for that device and tell you how to get back into it. Um, but it's, it's hard for us because we don't know what you've done to that device necessarily. Um, so that might be blocking the traffic. So once you've set this up, you may have a, a wireless access point, which is not a router. It's just literally got one network connection on it. We don't have one here, but you'd plug that into your network switch somewhere, um, and that would also receive a DHCP address on your network. 
that probably wouldn't have a DHCP service in it. It'll just pass on the, D, uh, the DHCP addresses from the console. So you're not actually routing between two networks there. But to connect your phone then, or your iPad, the only information you need at this point, once you know you're connected, is from about on the console. You need the console name. This device name is geo-ec, all in capitals. That's the password. So that anyone the who's password. following along with the app at home. Yeah. <laughs> So you need to go in the IRFR um, and you need to go to settings and you just need to add a device. You click on console, you can click plus and add a device in there. Put the IP address of it in, which is 10.101.91.101, which is the factory default. And then you've set that up. You can have multiple consoles in here that you connect to regularly. Um, and once you've got it, if you go back to the settings page, nobody's going to be able to see this, but up at the top, um, there's the name of the console and the IP address and some signal bars in green. So it's sort of pinging the console right now. So if that's if I got those signal bars and they're green, I've just got a notification that there's cookies on the terrace, just so you know. <laughs> so we'll be out there. Anyway. <laughs> Looks like we're we're, we're, really we're almost, almost done. done. Um, this tells us that um, my phone is seeing the console. It's pinging it effectively. It knows it's there. So I can just go back to the main menu and connect to that device with my virtual RFR. Um, and, and now then he's going to control. control it. I'm going to bring up channel one. That uh, full. And there you go. So no configuration at all there. Everything out of the box. Any so it's questions? not that hard. <laughs> so what I would say is don't mess with it first. <laughs> um, and you may or may not have this mind, but I have issues with um, the AFR software only allowing me to have three consoles saved in my in Really? My yeah, like when I go to add more than three, and yes, I do bounce around a lot, it will delete one okay. of my others. That is, I have five in mind. We should talk about that. Okay. I think that's really bizarre behavior, and we'll figure out a way to resolve it for okay. you. Any other questions? Um, I have had issues that if there are multiple people with the app, we're having issues um, both connecting, and okay. so it's only letting one of you connect to the other one? Yeah, you have to like connect to the other one, and then you're getting one of the other ones connected to the other one. Interesting. Okay, I wonder if they're picking up the same user number? So uh, if you want to give us a call in the space with two people, we can check it. And uh, just so you guys know, an update is coming out for these apps pretty soon. That'll give us a lot more granularity of control on that, too. Any other questions? I know you guys really want those cookies, so <laughs> I want a cookie. Um, we're cool. gonna, I'm going to be in the product lab for most of the time. If I'm not in here, I'll be in the product lab. Sasha will be around. So if you want to talk about anything specific, just come and find us, and we can do it out there. We're more than happy to help anything. Yeah, we can look at stuff on the product. Okay. Anyone need to sign for ETCP? You can come on up, and we'll get this paper going. If uh, please fill out course evaluations either in the app or come up here, and I'll give you a paper one. Mm -hmm. um, so right now I'm in a hybrid environment, but it's version three in the paper. Okay. And we're drilling down with one of these guys. Okay. Um, the only way I can do a wireless right now.